Good morning and welcome. Uh, it's terrific to have all of you here with us for this conversation about Speak Now, Marriage Equality on Trial, which as all of you know is the wonderful new book by Kenji Yoshino, our Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law here at NYU Law School. Let me say that uh, thanks to the generosity of the Vanguard Group, all of you should have received a free signed copy of the book, or if you didn't, you will. Uh, so thank you to Vanguard. <laughs> Uh, I wish I could claim responsibility for the perfect timing of this event, <laughs> or maybe I should say the Supreme Court's timing is perfect by deciding to hold oral argument uh, so closely in connection with the publication of Kenji's book. But the book, as all of you know, I'm sure, tells the story of Hollingsworth against Perry, which is the landmark suit against California's Proposition 8, which led ultimately to the legalization of same-sex marriage in California and is really part of the same story that is unfolding today in our courts, yesterday in oral argument in the Supreme Court and across this country. Uh, there is no one more expert in these issues in this country than Kenji Yoshino. Um, there is no one um, whose writing, I think, better gets to the heart of the matter than Kenji Yoshino's writing. And so there's no book more worth celebrating than this one. Kenji is a nationally recognized scholar in constitutional law and anti-discrimination law. Uh, he brings that expertise to bear in his writing and in his teaching here at the law school. He's written previously on issues pertaining to civil rights, including his very influential book, Covering the Hidden Assault on Our Civil Rights, which takes aim at how current anti-discrimination law fails to protect individuals against coerced conformity. Now we are really thrilled that here today to discuss his latest book with him is Rachel Maddow, uh, host of MSNBC's The Rachel Maddow Show. Uh, uh, we are all a bit starstruck by her presence here, <laughs> the most of all. Uh, you all know the show, which is to say that she need no, needs no introduction, but she'll get a bit of one from me anyway. Uh, the Rachel Maddow Show was the most successful show launch in MSNBC history and has since received many awards, including an Emmy, the Television Critics Association Award for Outstanding Achievement in News and Information, and a 2010 GLAAD Award. Rachel is also an author. She's the author of Drift, The Unmooring of American Military Power, which debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list in March of 2012. She began her career working for WRNX in Holyoke, Holyoke, Massachusetts, and WRSI in Northampton, Massachusetts, before gaining national prominence as a host on Air America Radio. We are really glad, really thrilled to have you with us here today, Rachel. So without further ado, I will turn things over to you and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Dean Morrison. That's very kind. <laughs> So um, to the extent that there is a vast left-wing conspiracy orchestrating most of the things that happen in life along numerological tides, as we know is the truth, um, Kenji and I did actually arrange for all of this timing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we got David Boyce and Ted Olson to defy the gay rights movement and their best lawyers and minds to go ahead with their folly strategy in the Perry case in California. We got Judge Walker assigned to it. We got the Supreme Court decisions in 2013 to give us that fascinating but propulsive split. We got the Sixth Circuit to buck everybody. We got them to pick Mary Bonato to do the oral arguments yesterday. We arranged for that creepy guy to start screaming about hellfire and animation in the middle of the arguments. Uh, all leading up to this. Uh, so you would have um, some anticipation today of what we're going to talk about. Kenji, congratulations uh, on this. And thank you for being willing to do this at such an auspicious time. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I will say that we're going to do this for one hour. We're going to end at noon. Um, there's a chance we're going to be taking some questions from you guys at the end of uh, this hour-long period, unless Kenji and I get so wrapped up in ourselves and the sounds of our own voice that we can't stop. <laughs> So uh, egos withstanding, we'd like to hear from you guys at the end of it. Um, Kenji, I want to talk about uh, the book and what the book is about. We have to talk a little bit about yesterday Absolutely. as well. Um, you quote Judge Walker early on in the book saying, uh, in, in the tr district court, in the trial court in California, where they heard a, a fact-based trial 
on the Perry case. He says, this is not the Supreme Court where we deal with these boxcar philosophical issues. We deal with facts. We deal with evidence. We deal with the testimony of witnesses. That led to what you describe as the most potent argument for marriage equality the nation has ever seen. How potent is the argument for Obergefell v. Hodges? I mean, how, how, how were those boxcar philosophical issues yesterday? Yeah, so I felt like it was not a cakewalk for the plaintiffs who are arguing for same-sex marriage. The justices asked really hard questions of both sides. But as you can probably imagine, having written this book on how important the trial was, I kept wanting to you know, jump up. Fortunately, the other gentleman had done so before me. And so <laughs> I knew not to do that or you get body tackled by four bailiffs in a nanosecond. <laughs> Uh, but I kept wanting to jump up and say, this was resolved at trial. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, so, for example, and in fact, there was a moment in the oral arguments where uh, Mary Bonato, who was arguing for the plaintiff, said, you know, listen, you know, when she was asked, you know, what about child rearing and isn't the sociological right. data out? This is Justice Kennedy. So, as you know, he's considered to be the swing vote. So whenever he opens his mouth, everyone in the gallery instinctively moved, leans forward to hear what he's about to Say So he said, you know, if we do this, we're going to have to do this without sociological data one way or the other because there hasn't been enough time. And I just wanted to tear my hair out because I felt that, you know, if you look at the trial, you had, you know, a whole day, frankly, of examination and cross-examination of Michael Lamb, who's a child-rearing expert, who talked about how these studies went back to the 1970s. Right. So there's only one way in which we can say that there hasn't been enough time, and that's to say that married same-sex couples would do better than unmarried same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. right? In other words, that we would be less good as parents if we were permitted to marry than if we weren't. Right? And I don't think anybody is making that claim. So we have at least you know, four decades, if not five decades, of sociological evidence. And so again and again with these questions, they did seem like you know, boxcar philosophical issues, whatever a boxcar philosophical issue is. <laughs> um, but they really did turn time and time again on facts. Like, does gay marriage hurt straight marriage in some way? Um, is this the best op uh, you know, optimal child rearing environment? You know, is opposite sex uh, coupling that environment? Time and time again, we seem to go back to the facts. And before we go to the next question, can I say that uh, on the timing point, I have to say that I think that the two happiest people in the United States of America when the Supreme Court granted a review was not any same-sex couple in the country, but rather my wonderful editor who's sitting here and my <laughs> publisher, right? So congratulations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were part of the conspiracy. Yes. <laughs> but let me, let me stick with that issue of the, uh, the evidence or the lack thereof or the... Um, weakness or strength of the argument about the evidence. There was this moment yesterday in the argument, Don Verrilli, the Solicitor General says, what respondents are saying here is that, interjection, so we got the oral uh, arguments, we got the actual tape of the oral arguments really soon after the arguments yesterday. If you have a cable TV show and you're allowed to talk about this stuff, getting the audio from the arguments from the Supreme Court is like being delivered breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next 30 years and you don't know how to cook. Like, it's the greatest thing on earth. <laughs> and then we got to do none of it on TV last night because nothing happened in Baltimore. Um, and so I'm, I'm, all, I'm all pent up with the, <laughs> with the transcript and these audio tapes, so I'm going to act them out. <laughs> so, Don Verrilli. What respondents are saying here uh, is that they want to exercise an attitude of caution because of concern about the welfare of children raised in same-sex married households. But there's quite a significant problem with that rationale, and it's this. Right now, today, hundreds of thousands of children are being raised in same-sex households. That number is only going to grow. All of the evidence so far shows you that there isn't a problem. And the state's argument really is quite ironic. Justice Scalia. <laughs> That's quite a statement. All of the evidence shows there is no problem. General Verrilli, well, I, Justice Scalia, all of the evidence shows there's not a problem. General Verrilli, I think all of the leading organizations that have filed briefs have said to you that there is a consensus in that and Justice Scalia. Well, I think some of the briefs contradicted that. General Verrilli, but, but even beyond that, I think the more fundamental point, and the point I'm trying to drive at here, is that you have hundreds of thousands of children raised in same-sex households now. What are they talking about? What just happened there? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually, uh, 
beautiful segue uh, into you know, what I try and, and grapple with in, in the book, because uh, what I'm really trying to argue here is uh, that this uh, book is, should be taken just as much as a pin or a valentine to the dying civil trial mm -hmm. as it should be uh, as an argument for same-sex marriage. Because with regard to any issue, the civil trial is really on the decline. In the 1930s, I think it was 20% of civil cases were resolved in federal court at trial and currently it's less than 2%. So these trials are unbelievably uh, important, but they're also uh, an endangered species. And I would argue that when you don't have a trial in a case like this, then when you get up above, then people can shove anything they want to say into an amicus brief, not be uh, subjected to the same adversarial testing. Right? So I think that what Verily was saying if I can be a little uh, anecdotal, it's something akin to what I experience all the time on TV, uh, where you know I sit there and I say all of the major uh, associations uh, of you know the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association, the National Association of Social Workers, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. The last one is the important one, as you'll hear in a moment. Anyone who's concerned with child welfare and who has like a professional credential has come out in favor of saying this does not hurt kids. Same-sex parents do not hurt kids, right? So last time I was debating on uh, this with, uh, uh, with another individual on the other side, my party opposite said, well, what about the American College of Pediatricians? They came out with a very different view. And then, uh, you know, I couldn't get in in time because the segment was over. Yeah. But like the American College of Pediatricians, okay, let's start with the American Academy of Pediatrics. The American Academy of Pediatrics was founded in the early decades of the 20th century. It has 60,000 uh, members of, in it. The American College of Pediatrics, on the other hand, has 60 to 200 members, was founded in 2002, an explicit right, opposition to the American Academy of Pediatricians' view on same-sex marriage. Right? Wow. So they fashioned themselves for this litigation, right? and so they're submitting a brief. So one thing that I think is really telling is that in the Prop 8 case, it's not only that people from the American College of Pediatrics were not called to testify, it's that they were not even mentioned anywhere in the Prop 8 trial because they knew that if they had been mentioned, everything that I just said would have come out and they would have been humiliated. Because of the adversarial process, because you must rebut, you must reply, you must answer the evidence. Exactly, but by the time you get to the Supreme Court, you know, this is Ali Orr Larson's wonderful work on the trouble with amicus facts. You know, you can actually just submit anything in an amicus brief. So you and I could submit an amicus brief saying, you know, whatever we wanted, you know, and that would not be subject to adversarial testing. You know, and generally, the agreement has to be between both sides, but both sides generally say we're going to let, you know, everybody in. So mm -hmm. you let your people in, I let my people in. Guess who filed one of the briefs in the Supreme Court? The American College of Pediatrics, right? So when Justice Scalia is saying, some of the briefs, you know, say that there's, uh, you know, sociological evidence that rebuts your claim. That's probably one of the things that he's referring to, but that would never pass muster in a trial. So that's part of the sickness in our uh, judicial system. Is today. there a cure for that? I think greater reliance on trials uh, would be a really good start. A mm -hmm. uh, greater understanding about the problems and the trouble with fact finding and, and amicus briefs. I mean, just yeah. to give you a, a couple other examples, I think we're finally shedding a light on this. And uh, Stephen Colbert and you uh, as well, you know, I think have, have done a lot on this issue. Um, the women regret having their abortions claim that was filed in the Gonzalez versus Carhartt claim was made in the amicus brief of Sandra Kano. If you actually look in that brief, uh, the statement that women regret their abortions is attributed to a doctor. The doctor turns out to be not a medical doctor, but to someone who holds his doctorate in electrical engineering. <laughs> the school from which he got his degree in electrical engineering is unaccredited and has since gone out of business. <laughs> So it's actually my But he's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> As are you. Right? Yeah, exactly. yeah, believe me on that too. <laughs> yeah. um, and similarly, you know, we have, you know, this is a much more less kind of inflammatory case, but you know, a case that is equally important to the litigants with regard to sort of copyright issues. Um, there was a claim that was made about how many books were published in 
the United States and stored in American libraries every year. Cited to a blog post, the link is now dead, and it looks like the blog may have even been concocted for the purposes of litigation. Wow. So this is a really troubling issue that is transubstantive. It's not just about same-sex marriage. It's you know, about any major social, constitutional, or legal issue right. that our federal the, courts The immediate are parallel in terms of the cable news world and, the, and to the extent the political world that reflects what we do uh, is the voter fraud idea, right? So um, one of the people who's uh, sort of the, one of the big lights on uh, the Fox News Channel, which is a conservative news network, uh, sort of made their bones as a, as a host by promoting the national threat of voter fraud as depicted by a 15 second squib of videotape showing a guy who literally braids his beard hair and screams on a corner in Philadelphia as, as dramatizing the massive national threat of voter fraud and voter intimidation at pol on polling days. And you know, with all due respect to guys who braid their beard hair and scream on corners, that <laughs> has been maintained as the preponderance of evidence that the public needs to describe and respond to this threat. And it's, I mean, we're all, you know, the solution to bad speech is more speech, right? You know, you can say whatever you want, even if you call it news. But um, <laughs> the, there is, what, what I feel romantic about, about your book is how in love with the law you are about how trials and the adversarial process can actually produce truth. I mean, I mean you, you close the book with this, and so maybe this is jumping ahead, but do you feel like there are, you know, in the case of women regret their abortions, in the case of, you know, is climate change real? Is, you know, voter fraud an empirical threat to the American democratic process? Uh, is, there, is there sense in trying to build litigation strategies or, adversarial, or ad, advocacy strategies around those things that do push things towards civil trial? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I would really push for that, given that I actually entered this, Rachel, without any strong priors about whether trials were a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I read the trial transcript, I mean, really, just to back up for a second, the way I started writing this book was to, when Judge Von Walker's <coughs> opinion came down on August 4, 2010, it looked unusually thorough, and he had 80 findings of fact. Yeah. And so that sent me back to the trial transcript, and, you know, with, you know, you know, my husband, who's uh, in the audience today, can attest to this because he, uh, I just sort of fell into the trial transcript and I didn't emerge from it until I turned the last page. It just mm -hmm. felt like this shining civil rights document and really the best conversation I'd ever had on this issue. So not only do I think this should be a strategy, but I think it um, is becoming a strategy in the sense that in the recent abortion case in Texas, they really pushed for a trial. Right? Mm -hmm. And they really were able to vet the issues you know, about you know, whether or not the various obstacles that people are putting uh, in, the, uh, in the way of reproductive justice uh, were substantial burdens or not on individuals. And so uh, that trial came to the same kind of conclusion. So I really am a, a true believer now. They say the most recent convert is the biggest fanatic, right? right. And so I'm just completely fanatical on this issue. And I think that the only sad part is that you have these incredible trials and then they don't trickle over into the public. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do in this book is to perform that you know, minor service of taking the trial transcript and translating it into a format that people might actually be able to consume right. in hopes of elevating the debate. Which I think you do. I mean, I think that you make the, empir you make the, the conceptual point about the value of this as a legal process, but you also you know, make people cry over the story of the young man who went through the uh, conversion therapy and survived it, and uh, ultimately through the process of testifying in this trial about that as an evil, um, becomes re-traumatized by experiencing that. I mean, that whole personal story behind it is just incredibly moving and just testament to your Thank you. Your abilities. Could I add a postscript to that since I've Please. learned since writing the book? So uh, Rachel is very kindly referring to uh, a debate about immutability. So as many of you know, especially those of you who have been subjected to my constitutional law class, <laughs> um, you know, immutability is one of the factors that the court uses in determining whether or not to get heightened scrutiny, right? which is a higher form of review. And if you get that form of review, then laws that classify on that basis are presumptively unconstitutional as opposed to presumptively constitutional. So in debating immutability, one of the things that the plaintiff's attorneys did, and here are Terry Stewart, not Boys or Olson, uh, as much credit as they get for other aspects of the trial. This is really Terry Stewart of the San Francisco City Attorney's Office, as his brainchild. She said, I don't want the human dimension of this trial to disappear with the plaintiffs. So one of the beautiful things about trials is that they're human events and that they're not just abstract, bloodless arguments. And this is true of all trials, but it's more true of some trials than others. 
the plaintiffs usually provide the human face of the trial, but what Terry Stewart was saying was, let that not be the end of it. For every one of these big ticket issues that we're litigating, I want a human face. And so when they were litigating the immutability argument, they uh, toggled in between what Harvard scholar Elaine Scarry, the literary scholar, uh, calls uh, narrative compassion and statistical compassion. So narrative compassion is the compassion that uh, stories stimulate and statistical compassion is data-driven compassion. To sharpen and fix ideas, let me just say that uh, Scary describes Ronald Reagan as having a ton of narrative compassion and very little statistical compassion. So reporting, not endorsing here. Uh, the distinction would be that when a homeless person was talking to Ronald Reagan, he would tear up and he would have a genuine emotional response. But if you showed him sheaves of data about homelessness, he would not be able to see the suffering embodied within those numbers. So one of the great things about the way they organized this trial was to draw on people's narrative compassion and their statistical compassion. Uh, because I think all of us assimilate our um, understanding of the world in part through stories, but you know, there's a nagging part in the back of most, most of our brains that says, well, is the story representative? Is the story true? Can I really make policy uh, on the basis of the story, particularly if we're in uh, the profession that we're in? And so what happened in the trial is that Ryan Kendall, this young individual, would come, came in and gave his very searing individual testimony. But two days later, a uh, statistician, uh, social psychologist Gregory Herrick, came in with all his charts and his studies and his data in order to back that up. And so it was a kind of beautiful kind of one-two punch. But to Ryan Kendall's point, he came in and he said, uh, my mother said that she would rather have had an abortion than a gay son. And she sent me into conversion therapy you know, in agreement with my father, and I was so traumatized that I became suicidal, had to emancipate myself from my parents, went into a spiral of depression, homelessness, and drug abuse, uh, and then finally clawed my way back out of it. And you know, when he was testifying about this, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. When I interviewed him, I did 40 interviews for this book, and when I talked to him about it, I got much more of both the the backstory and the aftermath, you know, both of which are quite striking and uh, that Rachel was alluding to. So the you know, backstory was that when they were initially prepping him, they were treating him with kid gloves because they were worried about re-traumatizing him. And so Molly Lee, who was actually one of my former students, uh, said, you know, this isn't working because you're telling this like it's somebody else's story. You've been so traumatized that you're telling this as if it happened to somebody else. So you can either bow out, which we're totally um, you know, willing to uh, accept and accommodate, of course, because we don't want to re-traumatize you, or we have to do this differently, but we have to put you to your choice. So he said, I'm all in. I want to do this. And so she said, OK, I'm now going to impersonate David Boyes and just ask you rat-a-tat-tat -tat, uh, questions to which you have to respond. And he immediately broke down. And he said to me, I had to come to terms with the fact that uh, this terrible thing had happened to an individual, and he had been completely scarred by it for the rest of his life uh, in a way that would never really leave him, no matter what else happened to him in his life, and that person was me. So even over the course of that one sentence, you hear the dissociation breaking from talking about this in the third person to talking about it in the first person. And he spoke vehemently in the first person on the stand, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And if you talk to Ted or to David now, both of them will say that that is a moment in the trial that sort of crystallized and galvanized uh, their efforts because they were so horrified that this could happen to anybody in society. The aftermath of the trial, after Von Walker you know, hands down his ruling, or indeed after the trial ends, Ryan Kendall goes back to being a, uh, what he calls a glorified secretary for the Colorado Police Department. And he does get re-traumatized by the testimony. So this truth-telling is not costless. And I want to say that clearly and at the outset, which is to say all of you as lawyers are going to go out, or those of you who are going to be lawyers are going to have these ethical issues uh, all the time about you know, how to prep witnesses and what kinds of risks and harms are acceptable to subject a witness to. Let me give you the story so that you're reminded of the potential downsides here. Because he said that he was so re-traumatized because he was on the one day, talking to the smartest lawyers in the country, on the next day, as he put it, sort of entering pawn tickets in Denver. And he said that he kept reprocessing his testimony to the point that he decided that he was going to commit suicide. And the one thing that saved him, he's one of the most other-regarding individuals I know, the one thing that saved him was that his sister was about to take the bar exam. And so he decided that he was going to wait uh, until she took the bar exam so as not to throw off her performance. And, uh, 
during that interval while he was waiting, Molly Lee, again my student, called to check in on him. So that's good ethical lawyering to make sure that you don't just let go of your witnesses after you uh, uh, conclude the trial. And she said, how are you doing? And he said, not well. And she was horrified when she learned how, um, what kind of a state he was in. And she said, well, what can we do to help? We'll do anything. You've done so much for us. Let us uh, return the favor. And he said, well, I want to be a lawyer, but I haven't even completed my high school degree yet. And she said, well, let's help, let us plan a, uh, make a plan around that. So uh, they made a plan. Uh, he got his GED. Uh, he applied to two schools for college after getting his high school degree, University of Colorado and Columbia. He doesn't get into University of Colorado. He does get into Columbia. <laughs> um, uh, that's kudos to Columbia. That wasn't a dig at Columbia. Uh, that's, you know, Columbia. Or at the University of Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he graduated summa cum laude right, uh, a couple of years ago. I had to actually call the IRB people to say, because I have to go through this whole process as an academic with uh, research with human subjects. And I said, am I allowed to write him a letter of recommendation now that I finished my book? And I said, of course you are. <laughs> you know, uh, in fact, after I told them the story, they were like, we'll kill you if you don't. You know? uh, and so I wrote him this letter of recommendation, and he is now about to start at the uh, UCLA Law School. Amazing. Yeah, so he will be a civil rights attorney. That's amazing. Yeah. I will tell you, the, um, in reading this portion of Kenji's book, I read this on a plane, uh, and I was having the perfect seatmate experience in which the seatmate and you pretend that you are only negative space and you're not another human. Neither of us touch the armrest. Everything's perfect. And I'm reading this portion of the book, and I'm weeping. We, I'm a crier anyway, but this is really good. And I'm crying and crying and crying. And my seatmate decides to break the wall between us and says, holds up a jar of airborne, you know, those effervescent vehicles, and says, for your cold? And I said, I do not have a cold. <laughs> this is a very moving moment in the book. And he said, oh, what's the book? And then we had a very long talk about it. But he believed I was ill because I was taken so emotionally. Um, <laughs> whatever the mess. problems remain, whatever problems remain in the book, I don't think Airborne is going to help. No, that's exactly right. We made friends. He was very nice. His name was Nick. Um, in terms of the arguments uh, yesterday and where we stand, Justice Roberts uh, talked a lot, and he made a case that echoed what Justice Scalia said uh, in his dissent in Windsor, which I think is a powerful case, and I think that you. Uh, are a little bit on the fence about this case that they're making, at least mm -hmm. that's how I read it from Speak Now. Chief Justice Roberts yesterday, quick change has been a characteristic of this debate. But if you prevail here, speaking to the pro-gay marriage side, there will be no more debate. I mean, closing of debate can close minds, and it will have consequence on how this new institution is accepted. People feel very differently about something if they have a chance to vote on it than if it is imposed on them by the courts. Mm -hmm. That, of course, echoes Justice Scalia uh, in Windsor, who talked about robbing winners of an honest victory and robbing losers of the peace that comes from a fair defeat, that there is a cost to these things being decided, especially in a national deterministic way, um, by the federal courts. Justice Ginsburg has expressed a, a similar sort of uh, uh, non-personal regret about um, Roe versus Wade and the way that it as a ruling had a sociological and political effect on how abortion is viewed in the country since that, since that ruling. Do, do they have a point and how does that point, um, how do you grapple with that in terms of where we are with marriage now? Yeah, so I, I wanna be really clear that, you know, I think that the court uh, is, can correctly and comfortably rule in favor of same-sex marriage now because the court is a passive body and it can't control the timing of when cases are before it, you know. Okay unless, you know, as you weren't joking in the beginning and you actually do control it. So unless you control it, they uh, can't really uh, figure out when the, the cases are going to come to it. So they have to decide up or down whether something is constitutional when it arrives on their doorstep. But I think what you're intuiting is quite right in that, you know, if the idea is, you know, sh would it have been better for this to have been done legislatively, right, before it got to the Supreme Court or not, you know, you're right that I'm very uh, in the swithers uh, about that because when the state court rulings were coming down, you know, I was happy, obviously, when Massachusetts happened. I was delighted when Connecticut happened, but the one uh, and Iowa happened. But the one that really made me jump in the air was that a few days after Iowa did it by court decision, 
Um, New Hampshire and Vermont uh, did it by legislative, legislative right? And so what I'm really trying to uh, drive a wedge between is where the most democratically legitimate conversation is happening, which I think we can have a conversation mm -hmm. about, uh, and where the best conversation is happening, which I don't think is up for debate. So the best conversation is happening in the trial courts, right? Uh, if you look at the legislative debates, people of goodwill, very smart, you know, what have you. It's just that the forum isn't created to allow for the same kind of intellectual um, joinder and yeah. rigor, yeah. right, of, of arguments um, that, so, you know, if you listen to, say, the Minnesota legislature hearings, which I was following uh, really closely, one person would sit, stand up and say, well, the Regneris study says that children don't do as well in gay families, and then, you know, half an hour later, somebody else would say, you know, well, I feel that that study has been completely debunked, right, and that was kind of it, right, so, uh, you know, the points just hang in the air and there's no kind of engagement, right? Whereas, you know, if Frigneris were, as he actually was, you know, uh, cross-examined on uh, at trial, the conversation would have gone really differently. So the idea is to take these conversations that are happening in these trials and then to airdrop them into democratic conversations that are unfolding. So uh, my ambitions for this book, as you know from uh, the end of the book, is to really not just think about the United States, where I think this debate is uh, gradually uh, coming to an end, and we really are at a kind of speak now moment in mm -hmm. the United States, but rather to think about this more globally. So I end the book by uh, talking about the debate that we were having in Taipei, which looks like it, it's going to be the first country in East Asia to do same-sex marriage, and to say, you guys don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like, obviously, this is your decision. Uh, you know, this is within your sovereign power to decide, but we had a trial that had really good arguments on both sides, strong lawyering on both sides, and so here is a product of that trial. And so that's really the hope for the book, which is to say, take the most rigorous and best conversation and then airdrop it into what everyone agrees is a democratically legitimate conversation. In, in terms of the political response to rulings that advance civil rights, though, we are, obviously, we have, there's, a, there's a very clear and very well-known history of backlash. Um, both to Massachusetts, well, to Hawaii, to Massachusetts. There's also backlash to Windsor mm -hmm. um, that we're living through right now. How, how legally resilient do you think that backlash is with these religious freedom laws, mm -hmm. with the overturning of local anti-discrimination laws, which we have seen? How, how serious a threat do you see the backlash we're in right now, even before a ruling on this latest case, um, in, in terms of the threat to gay rights? Yeah. I don't, well, I guess it depends on, on how broadly you take the, the issue of gay rights. So, you know, people often say, and you alluded to Roe earlier, that this could be the next row. I, I realize you're not saying that, but many people on the other side of this issue are saying, you've just created a Roe versus Wade. If the court rules for same-sex marriage, it's just going to be something that's going to be uh, debated for decades. And I would distinguish the two cases on, you know, really easily on the grounds of, you know, in Roe, there's actually a strong secular justification on the other side, which is, you know, regardless of, you know, where you are on the issue, I'm adamantly pro-choice myself, but, you know, if you believe that a life is being taken, that is a secular interest. If you believe that embryo is a life, you know, that is a secular justification for opposing abortion. Right? Whereas here, I don't really see the interest on the other side, and I don't think that it's just that I'm so in my echo chamber that I can't um, see it. I think it's that uh, we see the other side cycling among these arguments of, oh, it's optimal child rearing. Oh, it's you know, irresponsible procreation by heterosexuals. Oh, it's the deinstitutionalization of marriage. They can't seem to settle. And I think that that betokens this notion that there really isn't a strong justification on the other side. Well, is Lemon at risk, though? I mean, Lemon, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I'll get this wrong, but as I understand it, Lemon is what, from the 70s, is what says you have to have a secular justification. Religious belief cannot be the basis of a law that's not a const constitutionally permissible basis for a law. Uh, is, are, there, are there rumblings in conservative, uh, this conservative legal world that the Lemon Standard should be um, revised? Yeah, so that's a fascinating question, and I think that the most recent pronouncement we had on that was the Greece versus Galloway case about whether legislative prayer uh, was constitutional or not. And en route to saying that it was, you know, J Justice Alito said, you know, if the tests contradict, you know, legislative prayer, then um, the, test is, the test, test is a bad test, right? So it seemed like he was willing to revisit that. I'm, again, you know, perhaps too much of a Pollyanna uh, on this, but I don't think that that's a real threat. And I'll tell you why. Even when we were doing Prop 8 
and there was a lot of you know, muscle behind this idea that uh, people of faith should be able to express their religious values. It was kind of like a La Rochefoucauld thing of like hypocrisy as the homage that uh, vice pays to virtue. You know, there's this notion that we're still not allowed to say we're against this for religious reasons. So they, they use the referendum process. Why did they use the referendum process, which is such direct votes where you go into the closet of the ballot booth and you uh, pull the lever for closet. a particular law, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, yeah. right? I mean, I feel like as gay people have come out of the closet, people of faith have gone into the closet and have made their preferences, articulated the preferences through the ballot booth so that they don't have to be called to account for the fact that they're relying on their religious beliefs in order to enact secular law. Whereas if you are a legislator, there's a record, right? So that if you stand up and you say, God told me to you know, enact this law, then that's in the record and that can be used against you so long as a lemon test is still extant. Now your question is, well, does that mean that if lemon is threatened that this uh, status quo will be threatened? And I don't think that that portion of Lemon, you know, whatever Justice Alito was getting at, is really what is um, at risk with regard to Lemon. Because I think that um, there are just too many religions out there uh, that can create majority minority districts. You know, and so if you allowed religious belief to become the basis of civil law, at least at the level of municipality, Right. You could have individuals saying, well, then, you know, we are a whatever a community, this religious community, and our religion shall now be uh, the civil law. And so Diana Eck, uh, a religion scholar, says that we're not only the most religious nation uh, in the world, we're the most religious nation in world history. So when you have more than 300 major faiths represented in uh, the country, I think it's very hard, given that spread, uh, to accommodate all of those faiths. I think to the extent that we see backlash, it's going to be in these RIFRA laws. So it's yeah. not going to be. So I want to draw a sharp distinction between saying we're going to use religious beliefs in order to affect civil laws, like civil definitions of marriage, and we're going to use religious beliefs in order to exempt, exempt ourselves people. from laws that we accept are right for everybody else, but don't apply to us. Right. That's, so I think that's that, ladder that, is where the that's hollow coming. Away, hollow out civil rights protections of, at all levels and at all kinds, that even ones that have nothing to do with marriage. Exactly, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to ask you the bottom line question um, about where we are right now, which is, um, is there any chance, or how big a chance do you think there is that the Sixth Circuit will be upheld um, by the Supreme Court, that bans will be left uh, extant, it'll be a state decision on the other side? How big a chance do you think there is that this, the, the, there will be a, a pro-marriage ruling from the Supreme Court and that it will be an expansive enough ruling that it might be, uh, it, it might define a heightened level of scrutiny that, it, that, that puts other forms of anti-gay discrimination um, on the chopping block? So great. So uh, I'm very cautious about either inferring too much from oral arguments and in general of like reading tea leaves about the Supreme Court. Yeah. That said, I'm quite bullish uh, in this instance that uh, the Supreme Court is uh, going to do the right thing, which uh, is the 50-state solution. One of the things that was interesting in yesterday's arguments was when they turned to uh, question two, you know, kind of all the air went out of the room. So question two, question number one was, you know, is same-sex marriage something that's constitutionally uh, required? So the right to get same-sex marriage is something that's protected by the Constitution. Question number two was, assuming the answer to that is no, do states that don't have same-sex marriage have to still recognize same-sex marriages that were valid in the state in which they were performed? And ahead of the, when I, reading, again, not as a lawyer, that they had separated, seeing that they separated those two questions, heading into the arguments yesterday, I just assumed that they would punt on the first and they'd find something to chew on in the second, because it would be such an easier way out. Yeah. And then the second question just... Yeah, exactly. It fell apart. And I think that that's what's so fascinating about this, uh, because we, over time, have seen these way stations that instead of seeing this as kind of black or white or Manichaean, sort of it's either a marriage in all 50 states or marriage in no states, people have, across the movement, constantly tried to find these way stations. So, you know, in the last round, it was all about civil unions, right, and whether civil unions were enough, right? Yeah, and what that? was really yeah. interesting now, yeah, exactly, like we don't really talk about civil unions at yeah. all, right? So I felt like question two was another way station of saying, you know, okay, like even if we um, don't, you know, we can't stop this tide, can we at least slow it down a little bit so that the states can come to their own conclusions and have this recognition rule? Uh, but 
um, not require the states to perform uh, marriages. Uh, but I think yesterday's argument, as you say, you know, just showed that there wasn't any kind of vigor in that. You know, Alito was trying to uh, open up space, but the chief, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, quite vehemently said, you know, ultimately that's going to lead to the same result in a messier way, right. right? Because most people are mobile enough to, at least for one trip, to be able to go out of state, get married, and come back, right? And so that would essentially lead to marriage in all 50 states, even if there weren't recognition. Um, the last form, I feel like this is the last gasp of, you know, Zeno's paradox or something, which is that Governor Scott Walker recently said that uh, he would attend the uh, reception, or he had attended the reception, <laughs> but not the civil ceremony. And he uh, didn't dance. <laughs> he didn't dance, exactly. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, where is this going to head? Like, you know, I'll attend the ceremony, but I'll put my fingers in my ears during the vows, right. you know. Uh, I won't inhale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think that we see these ever finer gradations that, yeah. that say, you know, come on, this is, again, a speak now moment. It's going to be all or nothing. So that's what makes me more bullish about it. Um, if there is a ruling which says, not just that state bans are unconstitutional because there's no rational basis for them. There has to be a rational basis for them, and there isn't one. If instead the ruling is, yeah, there might be a rational basis. There might even be a good reason to have these bans. But a good reason is not enough. You need a great reason. You need a compelling state interest in order to discriminate against gay people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these bans must fall on that standard. If, if they do raise the standard by which discrimination against gay people is judged as this country. A, do you think that's possible that they'll do that? Mm -hmm. And B, what frontiers does that then open next in civil rights? Yeah, so I am leery about saying, I'm hopeful, but I'm leery uh, about the possibility that they would raise the level of scrutiny on the basis of sexual orientation, mm -hmm. at least explicitly, by going through the four factors of immutability, political powerlessness, capacity to contribute to society. Um, and uh, uh, what's the fourth one? It will come to me. Um, uh, political powerlessness, immutability, capacity to contribute to society, and whatever the fourth one is. Uh, history of oh, discrimination. History of discrimination. Yeah, right. thank you for that one. You would Extra think that I would, yes. uh, I would know that. Um, See, if you worked on my show, I'd buy you tacos for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> if you know something that the host doesn't know, you can talk. <laughs> Just email me. <laughs> I'll buy you a taco. Um, but I don't think that the, um, so that, I, I felt like that was the closest I felt to feeling like Rick Perry with my oops moment, right? <laughs> uh, Department of Energy. Um, but I, I, they just haven't done that since the 1970s, so yeah. I think that they just don't want to get into this kind of tiers of scrutiny in a, okay. in a formal way. Uh, I think that if they do it, the way that they'll do it is to shoehorn it into heightened scrutiny for sex discrimination. Mm -hmm. So one of the fascinating questions, yeah. exactly. Uh, and I thought that was a kind of game-changing moment uh, for me, uh, given that uh, Kennedy had asked that question in the 2013 Perry argument. Uh, but uh, to hear it coming out of the chief's mouth was different entirely because it suggested that he might be a six vote on this. I'm not optimistic at all about this, but if he does it, I think that that might be an interesting avenue for him because it doesn't force him to change the law with regard to sexual orientation, right? It allows him to kind of shoehorn it into uh, sex discrimination. And it's not that much of a shoehorn given that the laws as written discriminate explicitly on sex the basis specific. of sex. You know, as he said, you know, if a man is allowed to marry a woman, but a man isn't allowed to marry a man, that's gender-based discrimination. And so therefore, you know, you know, what's the issue here with regard to, you know, how can you argue that this isn't sex discrimination? And Rachel, there's another way in which I think this is um, a happy outcome for someone like Chief Justice Roberts, which is that it doesn't lead him to disturb the equal protection jurisprudence or give much more to gay people. Um, so he looks like he's, you know, in favor of the status quo. Uh, but it also um, takes care of the uh, polygamy um, specter that was continuously oh, right. raised by people like Alito. Uh, because the way to get around the polygamy uh, thing is to say, all we're doing is we're taking the standard definition of marriage and we're saying it seems to discriminate on the basis of sex. We didn't see that. We see that now because we've had this Ruth Bader Ginsburg sex equality revolution that abolished coverture and then moved all the way to basically equal, protect, uh, equal roles in marriage. And it's not just kind of a, a make way argument or a fig leaf argument, right? Because if a man like subsumes the legal identity of 
uh, his wife. Or alternatively, if men go out to work and women always stay at home, then you can't really have same-sex marriage. Like, it's just right. not economically, economically viable, work, right? right? Uh, so you need sex equality for same-sex marriage to actually be even on the table. And Ginsburg made the argument, oral arguments yesterday. So I think what's going on with Roberts is that he's looking at that potentially as a way of getting around the polygamy argument. Because when people come into court and they say, well, we're polygamists and we want to be uh, recognized, he says, well, the distinction that's being drawn between uh, you know, opposite sex or same-sex coupled marriages on the one hand and polygamous marriages on the other is not based on anything that the Constitution gives heightened scrutiny to. This is not a distinction based on, on the basis of sex. It's a distinction on the basis of numerosity. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution doesn't protect that under anything other than rational basis review. So that might be the way he threads the needle. It certainly seemed like he was trying to goose people into thinking about it that way yesterday. He was performing more than asking. Right. That subject was at least my take on the audio I didn't get to play. Um, I, have, I have one more question for you, and then I think we'll have time for one or two questions from you guys, so prepare to do battle. Um, and this is a, a point that Adam Lifdack raised in the, in the New York Times this week. Um, and analogies are, are awkward, especially when you're talking on civil rights issues and different civil rights issues. But a lot of people have been talking about whether or not marriage is to the Lawrence decision um, as uh, loving versus Virginia was to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, is that analogy apt? And the reason I raised Adam Liptak is because he made this point that he sees a sort of, that there is a 14-ish states tipping point where the Supreme Court is willing to move once it's only about for a rump of about 14 states that still have something. And so at the time of Brown v. Board, there were about 14 states that still had legally segregated schools. At the time of the Loving decision, there were about 14 states that still had laws against interracial marriage. At the time of Lawrence, there were about 14 states that still had bans on sodomy. And today, at the time of this decision, there are about 14 states, take or minus, give or take Alabama, uh, that, uh, <laughs> please take Alabama, uh, <laughs> that, still have, that still have operable marriage bans today. Is, is, there a, is that coincidence, or is there a case to be made that there is sort of a numerological tipping point in terms of the bravery of the Supreme Court? Yeah, I was thinking a lot about this. Uh, I think there is a lot to that, uh, is the short answer. Uh, and, you know, Kennedy, I think, worried everybody when he said, you know, well, what about the millennia? And, and marriage has uh, been defined as between a man and a woman for millennia. But then he made exactly the analogy in the same question, mm -hmm. right, that you just yeah, uh, 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 made, which is to say, uh, on the other hand, when I think about it, the distance between Brown versus Board of Education and Loving versus Virginia was 13 years, so 54 and 67, respectively. I'm being super precise about dates yeah. now because I flubbed the history of discrimination question. <laughs> um, and now we have a distance in between Lawrence versus Texas in 2003 and 2015, so 12 years, about the same. So, um, so that's another way of, th of thinking about it. But he was talking in terms of counting up years. I think your point is actually more uh, valid because it's not really how many years have passed, right? Because last time this was up before the court, only nine states had uh, same-sex marriage. And even Justice Ginsburg was saying, it's too early, it's too early, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so it's not really the number of years that have passed, but the number of states that have tipped. Empirical progress toward... Like, exactly. Yeah. So when Bowers versus Hardwick, that 1986, a uh, hor horrific decision that said, you know, the right to privacy does not uh, protect gays and the right to intimate sexual conduct, right, uh, was decided, you know, very interesting. You know, when I was listening to all the justices talking about millennia, right, there's a concurrence that is reviled now uniformly uh, by Chief Justice Berger in the Bowers case. It talks about how millennia of moral teaching have taught us that homosexual sodomy is immoral, right? And so therefore, on that basis alone, we should be able to uh, kick this claim out of court, right? And so, you know, I think we need to be really careful about relying on uh, the millennia. But more to the point, you know, in Bowers, 25 states had sodomy statutes on their books, and I think that that's what made Powell hesitate. And so once you get to Lawrence, you're absolutely right. It's 14 states, right? And it's a lot easier for the court to wash out outliers than it is to look like it's starting a revolution. Yes. So I think that that is uh, really, really going to tell uh, in these arguments that you know, it's just a lot easier for the court to say, um, we've had this debate. The debate is mature. We've approached the speak now moment. And now the rest of the states have to be brought in line. 
uh, washing out just a minority of the states than it is to say we're going to flip half of the states or in the case of something like Roe, you know, more than 40 states, the supermajority of the states, uh, in terms of uh, what our ruling is going to require. Right. It's also sort of a side of the caution argument that we need to be careful to see how this works out. Well, we're seeing it work out in the majority of the states right now in the country. Uh, we've got time for our one or two uh, questions and you've got to run to the microphone. So it's actually a foot race. <laughs> and the microphones are in the, in the aisle there. Hi. Hello. Um, in yesterday's argument, there was some discussion about the definition of marriage, which I feel is really quite misguided because the marriage has many different definitions depending on the context. So for example, in government, marriage means the ability to own property as tenants by the entirety or to file joint tax returns or to have communication privileges and evidence. Um, in a household, marriage means some sort of joint venture in a household. In religion, in Catholicism, I believe it's a sacrament. Um, there are different definitions of marriage, and everyone seems to be discussing marriage and concerned about the definition. I wonder if you would uh, respond? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I'm so glad that you, you asked it. Um, this came up in oral arguments, as you say, and just to provide a little bit of context, you know, it came up because uh, the chief actually said to Mary Bonato, you're not asking for uh, inclusion into an existing right, you're asking for a new right, right, which is the right of same-sex marriage. And I think that that's fundamentally misguided, even as a matter of the court's own precedence, so that if you look at the interracial couples who wanted marriage, if you looked at the prisoners who wanted marriage, they did not come before the court asking for the right of interracial marriage or the right of prisoner marriage. They were not saying, we are a new group seeking a new right. They said, we are a new group seeking access to an old right, right? a right that at a higher level of generality, right, we can be fully included in. And then, you know, I think your question is even deeper than that, you know, in, insofar as what you're saying is uh, the word, you use the word household. So how would we define marriage if we weren't going to define it in the way uh, that it's currently defined? In uh, the trial, uh, historian Nancy Cott gave this marvelous history of marriage. You know, I think that in itself is worth the ticket of admission because she says, you know, this notion that marriage is for procreation is kind of absurd as a matter of history, uh, because that was certainly one of, and you know, so it's one of the purposes of marriage, and it may be a really important one, right? But marriage had so many other entailments other than raising your biological children that you would conceive of the person that you were married to, which is how narrowly uh, our opponents have to define it uh, in order to prevail in this case, right? Uh, so she said marriage was about creating households. It was about creating a legal buffer in between the individual as an atomized person and the state, which was monolithic and scary, right? So both the individual and the state benefit when they're intermediating structures that are legal structures that carry both legal rights and responsibilities. So from the individual perspective, it's great because you can actually use the marriage for various purposes to keep the state from intruding into your affairs. So for example, the testimonial privilege, I don't have to testify against my husband in open court, right, because we're spouses, right? Uh, but from the state's perspective, the state gets something out of it too, right? Uh, the state gets something out of it because if I get sick, right, uh, my husband is financially and legally responsible for taking care of me, right? Sorry, honey. Um, <laughs> And so I'm no longer like a, a drain on the public fisk, right, with regard to uh, going to the state and saying, I'm disabled, you have to take care of me, right? And so both the state and the individual are getting something out of this bargain that extends far, far beyond this notion of, you know, creating one child and raising that child to make sure that that child is biologically connected to both parents and has gender differentiated parenting. That is a really mingy right, uh, if you'll excuse the legal term of art, uh, <laughs> definition of, of marriage that they're going with, that they're riding in with here. Time for just one last question. Hi, so um, my question is about sort of the broader national movement context, uh, because one of the big sort of, uh, you know, theses of the book is that 
the trial can really help to establish fact and sort of bring in a voice of reason when the democratic process is failing. Uh, and, and I think there are other issues where the democratic process is failing and the media isn't really discussing things well, like transgender access to public restrooms um, or, or you know, police brutality in the conversation we have about uh, racial profiling right now, where a trial could intervene to establish fact when fact is sort of uh, uh, rare in public discourse. And I guess my question is, you know, in the process of writing this book, do you have a read of, of whether or not other national movement leaders, either in the LGBTQ movement or more broadly in other civil rights struggles, are embracing this approach in the way that you seem to have embraced it? Yeah, so I think to some extent, this goes back to, so first of all, Jacob, it's great to see you. <laughs> hey. Um, I think this goes back to Rachel's earlier question about whether or not this strategy is being used. I think it is being used in the uh, uh, reproductive justice uh, context where people are asking for trials in order to figure out whether or not um, admitting privileges or what have you um, are truly necessary. Um, we had a trial down below and the death penalty case is being heard, you know, um, even as we speak, right, with regard to whether or not uh, a particular drug does knock you out so that you don't feel the effects of the other two drugs in the three drug protocol. So people are asking for these trials. I just don't think that we have, though, the kind of heightened level of consciousness, right, that we need. And if I can riff off of that for a second, I've always come into this thinking, um, I'm a culture guy, like culture is really strong and law is actually relatively weak. And my favorite example of this is a 2000 opinion uh, by the United States Supreme Court where they said, uh, does a Miranda ha warning have a constitutional dimension? And they said, yes, it does. And Chief Justice Rehnquist, no friend to the Miranda warning, said, um, we can't get rid of this because it's become so much of a part of our national culture. So that's culture is very strong. That's, we've had too many episodes of law and order, right? Uh, so that even if we, we know take- what, what he watches on TV. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So like if we have like this, you know, if we have a decision that says the Miranda warning is no longer a good law, people are still gonna be able to recite that and more people know how to recite it, I think, than can recite the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Uh, and so we're just done, it's, it's cooked, right? Um, so I've always been like the culture is very strong and, and law is very weak, right? But I think that this trial experience made me sort of think about it a little bit differently uh, insofar as you know, law and culture working together are extraordinarily powerful. So I think that the one thing that really helped in this case was uh, that the trial occurred and that was key because it brought the conversation to a whole different level. But then Dustin Lance Black wrote his play, Eight, because kids all around the country were saying to him, we want to help, what can we do? So he wanted to give them something to do. And so he said, I'm going to write this play that's a dramatic reenactment, as Rachel was doing earlier with the Supreme Court argument, <laughs> of the play, uh, sorry, of the trial. And we're going to have those enactments all over uh, the country. So now I think it's been performed in all 50 states and has over 900,000 YouTube um, uh, uh, views and has been performed in Japan and, you know, and, on, and, and, and many foreign countries. And so I think that what we're looking for is a kind of sweet spot of making law and culture work together in that way, right? So, you know, I think it's really important to have storytelling, like the very courageous, you know, coming out of Bruce Jenner and, and that discussion that I think educated almost instantaneously. I was following your Twitter feed on this, you know, on, you know, the, on transgender issues, right? But I also think that, you know, it wouldn't be such a bad thing if, you know, we had a trial on a transgender issue that thoroughly vetted Right, all of the issues that uh, pertain to the community in the same way that we had in the Prop 8 trial. But that wouldn't be enough. We would have to feed it back into the culture. So there would have to be the equivalent of Dustin Lance Black's play, of Joe Becker's book, of Boys and Olson's book, and in a humble way, my own work on the subject, of just trying to get that trial before the eyes of the American people. Uh, so that law and culture can have this mutually reinforcing effect. And the pressure of application is always more interesting when it goes both ways. Thank you. Your love for the law is, uh, is infectious, and as somebody who's in charge not of anything legal or anything important, but just the way people talk about important things, um, it is, it's a sobering but sort of warm encouragement to throw the junk out of the argument and to make sure there are, our democracy works well when people who lose the argument uh, also lose the fight. Uh, but that means that the arguments have to be good uh, and you make them better than anybody. So congratulations on this, Kenji. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.